I got a sure one. I'll show it to you. It's over here. I got yeah, the yeah. new sure one. Yeah, man. It's smooth. It's really smooth. Yeah, it's good. I can I can tell already. So uh, I'm getting a new camera. The... I'm getting the the new the Sony one. Um, that's like for more. The camera I have is like it has video on it clearly, but it's for um, it's a photography camera. So I'm getting one that's more of like built for like podcasting and uh, TikTok and YouTube and stuff. So I get that on Wednesday and it should be smooth. Are you still doing stuff with, it's a, uh, what's it called? The Players Lounge? Players Lounge, yeah. So I have a show with Aaron and then. It's Aaron Murray. Uh, oh, cool. Aaron Murray. So I'm trying to go, and then we did the dual threat with Hinden a couple of times last year. So I'm going to try to get Joe on this year, do some fun stuff with him um, and some of the other players. And then me and Trey Smith were talking about starting maybe a pod. Um, I think that'll be fun. And then I'm going to do something probably with the radio up there, I think, for the season, like do a little segment. So that'll be really we're trying fun. To, we're, we're trying to dive into it. Yeah, we're trying to dive into the into the space. It'll be fun. That's good, man. Uh, well, hey, so Devin get, didn't get a chance to stop by. Talk a little bit about your golf event because it was it was bigger than it was the year before, right? <laughs> Yeah, it was. It was, it was so a cool. blast. It was fun. Um, so the weather held off, which was really good, um, because we were looking at the weather report leading up to it and we we're nervous, but it was really smooth. So we had probably about 70 VFLs back. We had golfing, and then we had 20 sponsor teams. Uh, so we had a ton, we had a ton of guys back golfing. Um, their families were able to come out to the mixer. Tennessee National, they have the back lawn um with with it looks over the um driving range and so it has a bar back there it has like top golf swing suites and everything so we were able to do the long drive competition out there you're able to hit it and then see the exact yardage that the ball goes so guys started competing after the end of the round so it was really good it was a lot of fun man it was um it's obviously as you guys know with the events um it's a process especially leading up to it the week before just pulling it off and just then you start getting the text of people saying, oh, I'm coming, I'm not coming. And then you always get like 10 people that just show up that you've been texting the whole time um, to, to see if they're coming to RSVP and they just show up for the event. So just working through all the logistics of it. But no, it was another successful year. So hey, man, no one. And if you haven't put on events, you have no idea how stressful they are. Like, I, you know, it's, <laughs> <Literally>. it's <laughs> like whether it be a golf tournament or a football camp, which I know we're going to talk about today or. Or whatever it might be, like I always said, like the most stressful thing about events is getting people to come and then getting people to stay and it had everything to do with people. People, the actual like event itself usually runs pretty smooth. But I'll tell you, I've heard Tennessee National the way they've redone that. Some of the stuff out there is awesome. It's sick. It's sick. And it's cool, obviously, because it's the home of the Vols, because that's the golf team spot out there. Yeah. So that 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 makes it cool. We yeah. usually, um, so last year we had them out there. And so obviously everyone's at different stages of their golf world. So some people, they get that 500 yard uh, par four that they got out there gets a little daunting. So with the golf team out there hitting drives uh, for guys and they're hitting like 320 right in the middle of the fairway. And then you could use their drive on the harder holes just to make the golf course a little shorter. This year they had the yeah. SECs the week after, so we didn't get them out there. But the way that they've done the course, how they're building it up, like I, I relate it to how uh, Troubadour is set up over in Nashville. Yeah. It kind of has that same – it's going to have that same – it does already, but it has kind of – it's going to have that same flow. Whereas away from the city, it's very secluded, but in it, the neighborhood has everything you need. So, like, they're building a coffee shop. They'll have a couple restaurants out there. They're about to finish the clubhouse. It's already a really nice golf course as well. Um, They let you go out there and have fun and enjoy it and enjoy the time out there. It has really cool views on the lake and stuff. I mean, so it's, it's a perfect spot for us to have the golf tournament. So here's a question for you. Favorite golf course you ever played? Favorite golf course I've ever played. All right. So I, I've i gone from just like the avid, like I'll go golf anywhere to like, I'm trying to get bougie with my golf. I feel, I feel so bad because I was like, I'll never be like that bougie golfer. But now, now when I get to the golf course, I'm like, does it have a really good clock? What type of clock is it? Because depending on the clock and the driving range, you know what type of golf you're about to play. Um, so this offseason, there's a spot down in Savannah 
I played in a pro am, and so the day before we played, uh, just played some golf called May River, um, mm-hmm. in South Georgia, and it was like, yep. it, it was dope. It's very, it was pretty coarse, very uh, low key, but really nice. Had a really good clock on the driving range. It was fun. That was a good spot. And then, man, so I played a uh, TPC Sawgrass down in Jacksonville. But here's the thing, I played it two years before I started golfing. So I played it. I didn't even golf. I had a rental clubs. I didn't know how to hit the ball. The course was great, but I did it such a disservice. So now it's on my list. I got to get back down there and play it again. So now we got stuff to talk about. Yeah, this is my favorite. So I, I played golf growing up and all of that. And I'm like nine years old. And we had just got a condo down at Kiwa Island. My parents did. And mm-hmm. they were building the ocean course for the Ryder Cup. Okay. And, it, and okay. it hadn't it hadn't opened yet. Okay. So my dad had won a conversion van in a silent auction at Sacred Heart. But okay. So okay. We're, we're driving it and we're like, hey, let's take it. My dad, my dad had, had a good night, had a little fun. And he was like, I was driving on the out there and see if we can play a little bit. I'm like, and I'm like, nah, I was young, under 10. Like, okay, great. My mom's like, terrible idea. We get stuck in the mud on the putt, which is now the putting green. But so we have all the guys helping us are working there, pushing out of the mud. But then we ended up walking and playing a couple holes before it opened. And uh, and you're talking about a clock, the best clock in any golf game. <laughs> it's the ocean court. You know, what I'm talking about the Rolex that looks over and you got the ocean yes. behind. And oh, so, man. Uh, have you have you played down in Key where they have two courses called the River Course and Casique? There are club courses okay. down there. Casique's a Pete Dye course. It's old school. It's you have to walk it, but it's awesome. And the river course is a little more tighter, but they're I mean, I'll be honest with you. I think the ocean course is a really hard course, but they might put the ocean course to shame. If you get a chance, go check really? out those courses. Yep. All right. I haven't I haven't made it to that part, but I heard it's great golf. I played oh, and and so how far is that from Myrtle Beach? That's kind of close, right? Uh it's or a no. different. So this is like 20 minutes outside Charleston uh key what okay. seabrook is so uh i think it's a few hours not too bad uh i think probably like okay. two or three hours max okay i gotta get down there so are you are you a fan of walking the golf course or golf cart if it's so, a nice course if it's a nice course and it's not super hilly like getty's view i can't walk it kills my knees Fair. but if it's like a holston or it's like a river course where it's pretty flat I like walk. I actually don't mind having a caddy either. So my wife's anti caddy. My wife's pretty good. She's anti caddy. She likes to do her own thing. Likes to go out there. I don't like the caddy mm-hmm. aspect. I like like just kind of talking and conversing and have fun. But I'm fine yeah. to walk if it's not super hilly. Okay. You? So I had the first walk. So I wasn't. I wasn't a walker. I was like, why would I walk? Uh, ever. I was like, I've seen people walk. I'm like, I'm not about to walk a golf course. That's why they have golf carts. I'm just carting. Yeah, you know, I played East Lake in Atlanta. Yeah, you have to walk it. No golf. They don't have a golf cart like at the golf course. Have to walk it. And after like that experience, now I will say the the it was like a hole, and then the tee box was right next to the hole, so it didn't you weren't walking that far in between holes. But after that, and then in the pro am, we played with club car, and there are tempo walks, which are like the robot caddies. That like follow you around the course, which are really cool. So after walking those two courses, I was like, okay, I can see it. But around hole fifteen, you start tapping. You're like, all right, oh, dude, I'm ready for this thing to be over. Yep. Nope. I'm with it. Knees back. I'm like, I'm done. Oh. Cardio's done. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, Casey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've absorbed your uh, <laughs> no, no, uh, no, no. Here. Golf talk. Just, I uh, yeah, I do some uh, I do some walking to my father in law. Anytime I go play with him here locally in the course in, in Alcoa. You know he's trying to stay in shape, so that that is his exercise is walking the course. So you know I I, I haven't used a part since you know maybe at the beach in the summertime, but we walk every time. Okay. Okay. Uh, did you get a chance when Stretch Fusion was there to get all stretched out? Yo, so I was I was on slate to get stretched out. We so when they first got there, I was letting the other VFLs get in. I had to do some media. And then uh, we went out, we played the first nine and it started raining and they were all set up. So I'm like, that's perfect for the back nine. We're playing good. Let me hop on the table, get stretched out. And then um, 
I just didn't have time because they had a line. Like the guys absolutely loved it. Guys were in there getting adjusted, getting stretched. They were getting like restretched before the long drive competition. It was a really nice touch. It's legit, man. It's like you you feel like you just got a nice massage after it. And but it's but it's That's what they said. as the guy explains it, it's like that kind of stretching is it's what do you say? Like a massage helps you for the rest of the day. This will help you for the rest of the week. Yeah, it's cool because like so what we're doing is I think you'll like this, Josh, is like we're putting uh stretch stretch fusions, uh, a whole ancillary part of their company is gonna be entering into a bunch of our D1s. And so now okay. you're gonna have like a treatment center for like, and you know this from playing at the levels you have, but now high school kids are gonna have the opportunity to go in and get stretch, recovery, and physical therapy all inside one house. And you saw what it was like at the golf tournament. It's uh it's just such an added feature, and you do, you feel so much better. And you can get so much more movement. You get long, you know, your your muscles when you long game like that. You can obviously there's a reason they were doing it for the longest drive, right? But I mean, like exactly. just, you know, from a performance standpoint, it's it's a pretty cool deal. Yeah, it was smooth. It was smooth. And it was funny, like, um, because a lot of the guys, I mean, if they're done playing, they're like, I haven't gotten stretched out in years. Right, <laughs> so that was like right, the first right, time right. getting back on a table, getting yep. some PT, getting getting moving, and they and they felt really good after it uh please we gotta hey, take that out gosh tell me about the uh going so well and it just went really down a bad path <laughs> so that, that's the uh the the magic of uh editing um tell me the uh the camp coming up may 27th right it's we're uh you've done it since 2017 just uh kind of yes, talk about what, what kids can get with that yeah it's gonna be fun man may 27th um so it will be fifth or sixth year coming back to Knoxville and doing my youth camp, partnering with MR Youth, as well as exciting, excited this year to partner with D1 um, for the youth camp. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And the biggest takeaway uh, from my camps, man, is one, just the interaction, right? Being able to bring out the community, dive back into the community, teach the game that I love to the youth, as well as partner, partnering with local sponsors that already dive into um, the city of Knoxville. So that's going to be a lot of fun teaching the game, um giving some of my expertise but also bringing in coaches um from around knoxville that have coached whether it's some of my teammates or some younger studs from knoxville that have gone on and, and played a lot of football at a high level um and just being able to bring in the community as well as d1 and just have fun and and teach and be around the game that i love and the game that we all love of football so it'll be a lot of fun may 27th hopefully it's not too hot out there but if it is we'll make sure we get some type of snow cone truck or something to cool everyone off but we're gonna have a lot of fun over at emerald youth in lonsdale great kona ice easy pitch here right great kona <laughs> ice pitch uh, I, tell you, I tell you so my my son's gonna be there he's excited uh and he's he'll be He'll be eight this year. He's, uh, he's actually aspired quarterback. He's all pumped to, to meet you and go out there and do his thing. Let's go. So I was like, I was talking to him. I was like, hey, man, uh, you know, you excited about going to baseball games this weekend? He's like, yeah, is it, is, is it shaved ice or snow cone going to be there? Like, it's unbelievable, man. If you want a good business, go into that. Um, but I will say, like. Especially Ed, in the you know, summer in the South. Oh, dude. But the kids we've talked to are so excited about this. I think you've created – uh, not only like a really great camp, but now it's something that people look forward to. It's kind of like a, it's, it's etched in the community. Like they know every year it's the Josh Dobbs mm -hmm. camp. And I think uh, this year we're very, very uh, lucky and honored that you've uh, asked us to be part of this in a small way. And, you know, we're pumped about it, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. I think our coaches are as pumped as the kids are. So it should be a lot of fun. <laughs> it's so much fun out there man like and that's the biggest thing right every time you step on the field whether it's a game or practice you still want to have fun I think so many times as you get further along the journey in football right everything gets so much se very serious the stakes get higher there's more outside pressures around there's more people watching there's more opinions going on on social media but what I love about camps is it gets back to the fundamental point of why I started playing football is to have fun and enjoy times with my friends and, and the people that I go to school with and people that I grow up with. That's what's so cool about these camps. Like you see groups of kids, whether they're on the same travel baseball team or they've been playing at the same high school or going to play at the same high school or been on the same peewee team for years. They're out there with their friends. They're out there interacting. They're out there having fun. And then they leave, right? They And, and they probably have five or six things that they've learned. This year we're going to be teaching them how to run 40s the correct way and do the agility drills, having many combines. So we'll be able to work in some interesting things. So they'll have drills and, and techniques that they can take from the camp. By the end of it, man, like the smiles on their faces as they run over to that uh, snow cone truck is always, is always my favorite part. 
and the smile on the parents' faces because they usually go home and pass out. So they get a, they get a little easy Saturday. After. Yeah, so we don't put them a, to work for sure. for sure. I got I got to I got to tell you this one thing. What I think is so cool about camps like yours is like too is like let's say you've got kids that might that you know you said play on the same team, but they also interact with kids they might nor- normally interact with too, right? And they and they become new friends and they grow new relationships. So like it's it's really cool to see the interaction among the peers, but also like you said, like compete and become friends with new kids. And like it's it's truly a community event, and that's what I think is super cool about it. Uh, and like you're right, like I think they all leave, they learn something, they have fun, and their parents know it's a safe environment and it's somewhere they can. Because I believe you learn more lessons from the game of football than any other sport. Uh, and I think this is a, a, a perfect example of that. I'm excited about it. It'll be fun. And I think yeah. the registration is opening soon, right? Am I right? Yeah, it should be uh, this week. Should be opening this week. I'm going to go with the announcement on social media tomorrow, pitching and announcing it. And then uh, we'll get some news coverage out there. It's, it'll be fun. We're going we're to get the whole whole city out. We're going to have fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. So people just need to follow you on Instagram, I guess, to uh, to, to see that post. Yeah, follow me on Instagram or Twitter. Um, I'll be posting some stuff from our last camps as well as the information how to sign up to this year's camp, as well as all the information will be available via D1. Um, and so we'll be able to get the get the information out there, sign up, come one, come all, and we'll have some fun. Yeah. So uh, looking at last season, I was really uh, just I- impressed, in all honesty, with what you did going from you were in Cleveland, Detroit, and then Nashville in a span of like two shakes of a lamb's tail. Yeah, talk about Literally. that whole situation. What, that was, what was that, that was like? A great analogy, Casey. Can, can we I just like talk that. about that analogy? What did that just <laughs> Man, come that to was you? Great reporting right there. Yeah, I know. Golly, <laughs> I, I like Quentin Tarantino. Jeez, right, I don't know. Like, sorry, I just threw me off. Go ahead, Josh. Jeez. No, it was. Uh, it definitely was a whirlwind. Um, you know, just like the whole process, right? Like I got released. In the middle, I got released on a Monday in Cleveland. And so um, the goal of Cleveland, like, they wanted to release me because um, going into this season, right, they released a different player at the quarter, quarterback position. They would only have one quarterback on the roster going into uh, the 2024 season as as Deshaun come back, 2023 season Deshaun come back. So it was, a, it was a business decision. Those happen in the league, right? So as a player, when you're on the other end of the business decision, you got to make the right decision for yourself. So their goal, they wanted to release me, and they thought I was going to come back on practice squad the next day once I cleared waivers. Um, my goal and intentions, also knowing like Deshaun was coming back that week anyways, um, was that, okay, like if there's an opportunity somewhere else to go out and play, I want to position myself to be ready for that opportunity. So going back to Cleveland um, on practice squad kind of gets you swept on the rug, which was their goal in the end, right? Get you swept on the rug so another team can get you, claim you, boom, and you're back on Cleveland's roster. Instead, after talking with my agent and my family, um, I said, you know, the best thing for me probably is to just take the week from just an emotional standpoint, because you pour a lot into the season, right? Pour a lot into your preparation, whether you're out there every play or not, a lot of energy and effort and time and relationships go into the season. So I said, you know, I want to be myself going back in the facility the next day, right? So let me take the week, right? See what other opportunities are out there. Assess the situation, if there are visits to be taken, take those visits. And then next week, I'll make the best decision, whether it's coming back to Cleveland or going somewhere else for myself, the best business decision, right? So I gave a couple of days, got a ton of calls uh, for teams around the league. I ended up taking a visit to Denver, then literally flew, flew to Denver, landed Friday, did a workout and met with their front office and coaches, then left straight from Denver and flew direct to Detroit and then did a visit in Detroit on Saturday, met with their coaches after they were getting ready for their game. And then um, my flight, I had a big gap of time for my flight. So I got an Uber from the Detroit practice facility back to my apartment in Cleveland, which is like a two and a half hour drive. So uh, it was the whirlwind of a week. And when I got back, I then took a day and watched the games on Sunday. And then Monday, Sunday evening, talked to my agent. And I was like, the best decision for me, it was uh, at that at the moment, it was lateral moves, right? It was like a practice squad spot in Denver. They didn't have any roster spots. And then a practice squad spot in Detroit. I'm like, well, I'm not a practice squad player, but I understand the situation, right? So I ended up accepting to go to Detroit. 
So in going to Detroit, I knew like it was a lateral move from the same opportunity that was in Cleveland at the moment. But I also knew that making that move would kind of put myself on radars of other teams that they had an injury or something happened in the quarterback position. So, like, okay, this kid, clearly he wants a chance to go play somewhere. So he'll be willing to make the move to our spot. So I go to Detroit in there like two weeks. Uh, we play New York on a Saturday. And the next week is Christmas Eve. We play on Saturday and then we're off for Christmas. So we fall back from New York. We win. So we have Sunday off. And then Monday we have meetings at about one o'clock. So I land at 10 o'clock from New York, drive back to Cleveland. I go back to the hotel. I pack up all my stuff, drive back to Cleveland. That's very important. Drive back to Cleveland, uh, spend Saturday night, Sunday night in Cleveland, ship all my Christmas presents home. Um, and then I drive back to practice on Monday. Get to practice on Monday, go through practice, get to my phone after practice about six o'clock. My agent calls me. He said, hey, Tennessee wants to sign you. Tannehill's out for the year, got injured the week before. And they want to sign you and they want you to dress to play potentially on saturday it's monday night i go okay cool he goes all right they're about to call you go back in the qb meeting room i'm sitting there boom i get a call i go uh coach i gotta go i gotta go use the bathroom so i walk to the bathroom i answer the phone um they're like hey it's tennessee titans we're gonna bring you in we'll get you in tonight because we need you to dress saturday and we need you to start going through the offense so you can get a hang of it i go cool when's the flight it's like 6 30 they go, the flight's at eight. Can you make it to the oh. airport? So it was very important that I had packed up all my stuff a couple of days earlier because I had nothing in the hotel. All my stuff was sitting in the car. So I was like, yes, all my stuff's in the car. I'll go straight to the airport. Mind you, I only packed for like five days. So I'm like, I'm going home for Christmas. I'll just pack a bag for a week, go to Detroit. And then when I get back from Christmas, probably have another day off. I'll go back to Cleveland, get my stuff, finish off the season. So I just had a week bag pack. Boom. So I go in, say goodbye to all Detroit. Tell them, first tell them, like, hey, Tennessee's signing me. I got to go catch a flight, sprint to the airport, go to the wrong airport the first time, then figure out where the right airport is. So there's two airports in Detroit. Get to the airport, enough time, make it like 10 minutes before flight's taking off. Get on the plane, land in Tennessee, and then, um, yeah, then go through the week of practice and then dress um, to dress on Saturday. And then leaving the stadium, coach goes, hey, I think you're going to start on Thursday. So can you come in on Christmas so we can start going through the playbook so we can get you ready to play on Thursday? I'm like, sure, man. So That's it was insane. a whirlwind, whirlwind of like four weeks. It was all blur. At this point, it felt like a whole season just in that stint. Um, but yeah, man, it was a whirlwind. It was crazy. Can I add one thing to that? I think that Josh proved, we have a lot of athletes, Josh, you obviously listen to this, this uh, podcast, mm -hmm. a lot of young athletes that Brandy One are going to watch this and hear this. And I think you're an epitome of what you just talked about, which is a lot of athletes talk about getting ready. You've stayed ready. Because if you mm -hmm. weren't ready, you wouldn't have been able to jump in and do that, right? If you weren't trained right, prepared, all that stuff, physically, mentally. So how do you, like last year, I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a you know, type of movie type story, right? Like that's like, a, that's not, yeah. A, yeah. So how do you mentally and physically, when you're going through all this, you know, transition from cleveland to, to to denver to detroit and getting signed and then going to tennessee like how are you staying prepared physically and mentally during that time so you out of a drop of a hat can be in tennessee and be playing on national television as a star yeah. of the tennessee titans and you played well too yeah yeah on yeah. top of that i think uh so the biggest thing that i i and people say is very cliche but at some point like it's truth because so many people, so many of the successful people say it and do it, right? You have to have your routine. And that looks different for each person. Like how I prepare is completely different than how a Deshaun prepares or Ryan Tannehill prepares or a Big Ben prepares. We all do it differently. But you have to have your routine that works for you. And then you have to stay um, loyal to that routine no matter what, right? Like through that, for example, right? The week that I was technically off sitting at home. Right. I still did was doing I still did my Monday lift. I then did my Tuesday lift in the apartment complex. I did my Wednesday workout. I did my Thursday workout. And then I got a, got on a plane and went to Denver. You know, so it's still like staying in that routine, no matter what outside factors are thrown at you. And I think like that's the biggest thing. We're, when you're, you're a young athlete, right, it's it's finding and establish that routine as quickly as possible. And then second, to your point, uh, Devin, it's like you always have to stay ready, right? There's, because it gets to a point um, 
in every athlete's career, there was a time they were put on the field and no one expected them to succeed. And if they didn't succeed, as everyone expected, they would never get put back on that field ever again. And so when those situations come up, if you're if you're trying to get ready for that situation, you're three steps behind because that's what they're expecting you to do. But if you always are staying ready, right, you're always you're in your book. You're preparing the right way. You're physically preparing the right way. You're mentally preparing the right way. You have a routine and you're staying in it no matter what outside factors and forces are thrown at you. Then you never have to get ready. You're just always ready. You're always prepared. And when the moment comes, it's never too big because mentally you've already put yourself through every situation you have to go through. So now you're just read, reacting and playing football rather than thinking about what you have to do. Josh, that makes me think of the new uh, S2 evaluations. Mm -hmm. um did, did you were, was that a thing when you came into the league no i was looking at those i don't even know what that test is so when i was coming in they um each team kind of had their probably their own version of what that s2 co cognitive test is because i believe it's like a memory test there's like some memory in it there's some pattern recognition so when i was coming out at the senior bowl each team like you have to meet with each team randomly so you're just walking through trying to get some breakfast and some scout or coach comes, pulls you into some room and then starts um, asking you questions and grilling you. And then they usually will have an iPad. So they will have a runner with an iPad walking around, getting each player to take their own, their team's own cognitive test. So I'm assuming just because every team was already doing it, they just came out with a standardized one. So you weren't taking 32. You just take one and then all the teams get the results. Um but I'm assuming it's something like that. But I've been seeing the results, and I, you know, I think I think I think a lot can be made of them, right? But like at the end of the day, is the kid a good football player or not? I think that's yeah. what it has to come down to. Obviously, there's tells of can he be a good football player? But I think sometimes people kind of read too much into that stuff. Honestly, I think you look at like Lamar Jackson. I remember when he came out; he had some really low cognitive test scores. Remember. And then look at the career he's had. He's had a phenomenal career, you know? Yeah. So to your point, Josh, I mean, I think that it's like, I, it's always, I always think it's funny when people put so much emphasis on standardized tests to get into college, right? And then you see these kids that have gone on being super successful after they take these tests, but you, to your point, can you play football? It's kind of like, yeah. the, it's like, it's, 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 it is what it is. Um, but it is interesting to see how they're kind of uniforming that. I think you hear some, uh, interesting story from the senior bowls of the day. I remember some of the stories <laughs> oh. I've heard over the years have been uh, interesting senior to say Bowl, the least. Man. Yeah. The senior bowl is like the wild, wild west. Uh -huh. so you get there, yep. you get to Mobile. It's in Mobile, Alabama. So you would think you're going down to the pan it would be warm. Never warm. It's always like in the 30s. Yeah. Makes no sense why it's so cold down there. And then you get there and you walk into the hotel and at any point when you're walking through the lobby, it's free game. So you got the, the elevator. And it's always free game for you to get pulled for an uh, uh, interview, uh, for questioning, a meeting with coaches. By my year, they said the Saints, they were having – you would show up, and then they were they were saying – they would come pull you. They would say, all right, go downstairs. And then they would put you in a car and, like, <laughs> blindfold you, drive you around the city to some random room, and they were, like, grilling people and, and asking them questions. Now, I don't know how, how much fabrication there was in that, but – there was some truth to that story. They were, they were taking people off site and interviewing them. It's like, it's it's we always it's D1. always funny. Yeah, because, we did that uh, Casey. You're trying to get them yeah. ready. Yeah, we took we took Casey and dropped him off in the middle of nowhere, and he had to find his way back. It was a lot of fun. It's like mm -hmm. it's like capture the flag. Yeah. Um, Two weeks later, it worked out. Yeah, well I was for back me. and safe. Yeah. So I have one last my last question for me. I know Casey's got about four, 14 questions here. Um, NFL draft coming up. I'll put you on the spot. You're the Cleveland Browns. Who you select? Cleveland Browns. My my. I, you guys can hear me, right? My camera froze. We can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Let me let me leave and come back. One sec. All right, I'm back. Y'all hear me? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. All right, I'm the Cleveland Browns. What's happening? Your, who do you pick? And who? What is your top priority in this year's draft? Top priority for the Cleveland Browns in this year's draft? 
Mm, that's a really good question. We added some really good pieces in free agency. Um, you know, I think you always can bolster your roster with an edge rusher, right? Like Isaac was up here. I think we lost two edge rushers from last year. Clowney was here. They're both not back. So you, obviously you have Miles Garrett, right? We have Isaiah on the other side, who's a young emerging player. Um, but you always can bolster your roster with the defense that we play in the conference that ran with the edge rusher. So we'll probably pick an edge rusher early and then add an alignment at some point and another skill guy. So I think those are kind of like the those are those are probably our top three priorities. Um, I'm thinking and and in that order, right? Edge rusher early. Uh, I'm not sure how early we're picking, uh, but I know we have a first round draft pick this year. We did it last year because they traded it for Deshaun. Uh, edge rusher, um, lineman, maybe safety, right? We, uh, John, uh, JJ didn't resign in free agency. So, starting safety, young guy got to step up or you go draft one. So, edge rusher, safety, secondary, skill guy, O lineman. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Sounds, uh, that, that... GM Dobbs. Yeah. GM Dobbs, baby. <laughs> that's the, that's the GM in me. Yeah, right. You, around, you go around enough, you start thinking like that. Yeah. Um. So I actually put on Instagram, uh, we've got you on the podcast asking people to give me just a couple questions, like space related, because yeah. those those are the kind of things I told you. We talked last week about a guy was wanting to know your thoughts on SpaceX. Mm -hmm. Um. But real quick, I, I liked this one. Would you rather go to Mars or start in Super Bowl? Start in Super Bowl. Because I would like to go to Mars, but no one's no one's gone to Mars and come back yet. So <laughs> that, that, that's, that's still that's still testy waters Touché. now. That was good. You know, that was good. If I go to yeah. Mars, I, I'm trying to come back and live live to tell the story. I'm not trying to go to Mars and have my stories die on Mars. You know. Yeah. You don't. You don't. You don't got to be the first guy. There. I don't need to be the first guy. I'll be. I can be the. I'll be the five hundredth guy. I'll be yeah. the thousandth guy. I want to go. But I'm not first in line. I'll tell you that. Right on. And and one more. What VFL would you take with you into space? What VFL would I take with me to space? Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a long trip. Jalen Reese Maven. And I'll tell you why. Jalen still asked me if the moon landing is real or fake. And listen to this. <laughs> I So in college, I went out to Arizona to participate in the AIAA competition where we had to build a model airplane and fly it. One of the judges was an astronaut who's gone to space. So me being the great teammate I am, I had her call Jalen to FaceTime him for an hour and talk to him what? about what it's like to go to space. I get the phone back. I go, do you believe it's real now? What do you think he said? He goes, no. I'm like, Jalen, all right. So that is my one thing. I take Jalen Reese Maven. He will be strapped to the rocket right next to me and we're going to space. This That's podcast good. just went viral, by the way, <laughs> put this on, on TikTok, and we're going to get a lot of conspiracy theorists uh, on this. Um, what is your involvement still with NASA? You still do anything with them? Yeah, so up here in Cleveland, they have NASA Glenn, um, and they do a ton of research, and they have the Ohio Institute of Aerospace. Um, so currently, I'm working on a STEM outreach program with them uh, for the youth of Cleveland to whether it's creating visits and trips and tours over to NASA Glenn to see their facilities here. They have a in big internship summer program that they're working on building. Um, and so my goal is to partner with them to help bring some of the youth to Cleveland, take them down to Florida, um, allow them to see a rocket launch in person, see all the history down there behind the Apollo missions and the shuttle programs, um, and just learn what it's like to be an aerospace engineer and see um, what the work goes to firsthand. Um, so I think those will be really cool experiences. So we're working on building out that programming um, as well as partnering with the Browns to continue to help that outreach. So um, I do I do a lot of work with them um, in the community. Um, and then I've done the internships in the past. So that's something uh, obviously I, I have a lot of a lot of a lot of little pans, pans in the in the fire going around going around my, my personal kitchen. Um, but at some point we'll continue the internship and and continue yeah. to learn it, learning about the cool opportunities in the space world awesome quick call back to jalen reeves maven uh at the uh, long drive competition at your golf mm -hmm. thing that was fun to watch who won that, that was good that who was won? good I, I, Col colton jumper's a two-time winner right now for the long drive hit? competition he's like 
350, 353, I believe, was his long drive. Just absolutely bombing it. Now, it was a stipulation. His winning drive was a little off the fairway on the screen. But 350, I think my first start was like 311. And then I just went up there swinging for the fences and got like 335, right? So he's beating people by 20 yards, 30 yards. So it's like, okay, we can't, we couldn't disqualify him for that. So, but I think next year we're going to try to, we're going to try to bring in some big hitters to, to give him a run for his money. Cause he's won two years in a row and I'm not trying to give him that same trophy again. No, next absolutely year. So Colton, not, no. You will have some competition. Next there you year, go. Yeah. Our guy, Jesse Medford was there playing. Yeah. Yeah. So. Jesse, Jesse was hitting the ball. Jesse was smacking it. Yeah, Jesse yeah. was smacking it. We had like, I will say the, it was funny. Like that was the cool part about the tournament, right? Like last year it, it was a ton of fun. And but the guys like when the guys showed up last year, they were just so happy to see each other because they hadn't seen each other in five, six, seven, eight years or longer. So everyone's like just like running up, hugging each other. And this is the time when you're supposed to be getting dialed in on the driving range. And no one was hitting balls on the driving range because they were all just fellowship and fellowshipping and hanging out. This year, when the guys showed up, they were locked in. Like they that's awesome. They were that's like awesome. they were like shaking, shaking hands and then getting back, like had the had the AirPods in, like people were dead serious. And that was so fun just seeing like the growth of how many people just from in a year really started taking golf, like super serious just for this day event. And so it's going to be cool to see how it grows. So yeah, get competitive. Awesome. Josh, I got just one more minute and something I ask everybody, what is your favorite workout exercise? My favorite workout exercise. Whether it's I like in the gym or wherever. So I like in the gym, I like to squat. It's just a full body thing and, legs feel full the beast so i'd like to make sure my legs are, are nice and toned so i enjoy squatting obviously when it gets heavy i don't enjoy it <laughs> as much that much but um it's probably my favorite lift and then i love throwing like it's like just like a, a shooting guard love shooting right point guard love shooting like get your shots up i just love throwing so whether it's stationary spots or or working like targets or just going out throwing live routes i just love throwing yeah Right on, man. Well, we can't uh, wait to be a part of the camp May the twenty seventh. Yeah. Uh, follow Josh on uh, Instagram and uh, and Twitter, I guess, to find out uh, more about uh, how you can sign up for the camp. Without a doubt, I don't have a blue check anymore on Twitter, so it might be harder to find. But but just make sure you guys stay tuned for all the updates. Still got the blue check on Instagram, so you guys will see it. But yeah, yeah. follow me Twitter, Instagram. TikTok, whatever. We post all the socials as well as the Extraordinary Dobbs Foundation page, as well as D1. I look forward to seeing everybody May 27th. We'll have some fun. All right. That's good. Thanks, Thanks man. No problem. Thank you all.